A gruesome story leads off our newscast. Milwaukee police found body parts in a north side apartment and now they wonder if they've uncovered some kind of death factory. 31 year old man who admitted to killing victims in his apartment, then dismembering their bodies, may have murdered up to 17 people. The police got here in the middle of the night and what they found was an apartment full of pieces of people. The bodies were dismembered. Literally piecing together the information is going to be difficult to figure out who the victims are in this case. People were shocked. They were awed and they couldn't turn away. I was saving body parts such as... As my obsession grew, I wanted to keep them with me. No one had a clue as to what was happening for, for over a decade. If you were out on the street now, would you still be committing the crimes? Probably. If this hadn't happened, there's no doubt I probably would be. I can't think of anything that would have stopped me. Dahmer was undoubtedly a monster, one of the most notorious serial killers in US history. 15 consecutive life sentences was the punishment that he would receive for the unthinkable damage caused to many families and friends. Fear, fantasy, fetishism, the fuel that drove him to commit 17 murders across a span of 13 years. In this episode, you will have access to Jeffrey Dahmer's never before heard audio tapes. These tapes will accompany our harrowing impact statements from our victims, serving as insight behind the monster himself. Which brings us to our first victim testimony. The deaf mute guy. I wanted to keep him with me, so I gave him a drink with the pills in it. Fell asleep, and I wanted to see if I could uh, think of a way to keep him with me without actually hit, you know, killing him. Again, ma'am, would you first identify yourself, please? My name is Shirley Hughes, and I'm Tony Anthony Hughes' mother. Anthony Hughes was Dharma's 12th victim. FBI records state that Hughes was just like every other victim, a grotesque attempt at the ultimate level of dominance. What makes Hughes unique was that he was not only a mute, but also one of Dharma's first attempts at life after death. And so, uh, I had a drill at home, and, uh, it's gonna sound bad, but uh, took the drill while he was asleep, drilled a, a small hole in his to see if I could uh, make it so that he would uh, just sort of be like uh, in a zombie state. A twisted zombie-like experiment, a real-life lobotomy in the bedroom. These details leave an impact, and they certainly did for his mother while she read a poem from the perspective of her mute son in the final moments before Dharma killed him. Why am I a victim in your cruel and ruthless world? Listen to me anyway. Try to have mercy on my moans. Look at the tears roll down my face. See that each one is a cry for help. Tell me just what is it that I've done to you to make you such a monster, to make you such a maniac, to make you such a devil. My God, who are you? What are you? Is there anyone that can help me? Mom, dad, sister, brother, someone, please help me. What ha what's happening to me? Everything seems to be slowing down. I'm confused, I'm drowsy. My coordination has been contaminated. My friend, what is it that you've given me? What is it that you're doing to me? I'm helpless. Is that a thrill to you to know that I can't fight you back? Yet you have total control over me. My life is in the hands of once a friend, but now a total stranger who have become my worst nightmare. But one day, I know you'll get caught. You think you're smooth at what you're doing. Remember, whatever's done in the dark, it will come to the light, and the whole world will know just how ugly a person you really are. Mom, I'm gone. My hope, my breath, my want to live have been taken away from me unwillingly and emotionally. Two fingers and one thumb means I love you in sign language, my son was deaf. When you cry, take one teardrop and place it outside your window ledge. And when I pass by, I'll exchange it for one of mine. Two fingers and one thumb, mom.
buried within myself for many years, and it's like trying to pull up a two-ton stone out of the well. To use Dharma's words, this next victim's murder hit the family like a two-ton stone. The circle of life dictates no parent should ever outlive their child, but this is exactly what happened to our next family. Unfortunately, the live footage from court hasn't been released, but this Netflix dramatization takes nothing away from the father's reaction. What drove this reaction was the murder of his son, Konrak. With the routine photo shoot in play, Dharma drugged the 14-year-old. He was still trying to figure out how to keep his prey alive, yet submissive. So with the procedure he was still trying to perfect, he decided to adjust his techniques. Hard down, uh, all the way to the brain. No fluid in it. No fluid that I could see. And no bleeding. He was sort of wrong, you know, wrong and everything. He wasn't dead or anything. He talked. And I thought maybe I'd be able to keep him that way. While Dharma then ran out to the bar, Konorak almost managed to escape. Unfortunately, he didn't get too far. Police arrive and Konorak is now sitting with a blanket around him at the scene and the officers are approaching to find out what's going on. Dharma gets back from the bar. While that was going on, Dahmer came up the street. And these young women interceded. They asked Konorak, what's your name? He couldn't talk. Two 18-year-old black girls protecting him from Dahmer. Dahmer figured that as a white guy, I could tell these officers my version of the story. This is where it gets crazy. The police thought he was drunker than a belly goat. So what did they do? They don't just leave him. They take him into a place of safety, the apartment from whence he came. Dahmer put Konorak on the couch, then allowed them to look around the apartment. But they didn't look hard enough. Little did they know, not more than five feet away from a child who was about to get murdered laid the body of Anthony Hughes. Knowing the horrific details of this case, we now see on the day of the testimonies, Konorak's father as he shows his anguish at the loss of his son. We believed in the American dream. But now, we're living in a nightmare. Of Jeffrey Dahmer Kondil. And it's all because of Jeffrey Dahmer. He robbed us of our son, Conrack. He robbed us of our dream. In ninth grade, they uh, started a, uh, a baby pig. After we were done with the dissection, took the pig's head home and took the and uh, kept the for a while. Why I don't know. This victim impact statement comes from Janie Hagen, the sister of Dharma's fourth victim. Jane, would you identify yourself first? Yes. Please? Good morning, Your Honor. I'm Janie Hagen, the sister of Richard Guerrero. I am here as a spokesperson for my family. In March 1988, after convincing Guerrero to come home with him in exchange for money, Dharma drugged, then strangled and dismembered him in his grandmother's basement. He would kill somebody, the body would be upstairs in the bedroom, the grandmother would wake up, and Jeffy would chit chat with his grandmother and send her off to church. My thoughts obviously weren't uh, the thoughts of the same person at the time. Uh, I would have rather he stayed alive, but strangling seemed to be the way to keep him. Wanted to keep him, I guess that's the best way to describe it. This is just a small insight into Dharma's dark, twisted mind on the night of Guerrero's murder. So it's understandable why these next words leave such an impact. So Jeffrey, when you killed my brother Richard Guerrero, you also killed my father and my mother's youngest future. And my three brothers' lives, including my life, my husband, and my three children, will never forget this tragedy that you inflicted upon us. Jeffrey, you are el diablo, el puro diablo que estaba suelto en las calles de nosotros. That means the devil, the pure devil, that walked out in the streets and was loose. So, Your Honor, please, I beg you, don't let this man ever 
walk our streets or see daylight again. Thank you. Thank you, man. People go to these gory horror movies to, to get a glimpse at, the, at what they show in the movies. The only difference is I did it for real. I don't even need a microphone. My name is Rita Isbell. No, ma'am. Rita Isbell came in with some fire. Her brother was Dharma's 11th victim. On April 7th, Errol Lindsay met Dharma on the street. Dharma had now mastered the skill of deception. He convinced Errol to come over for a beer. But this case is different for two reasons. The first is that Dharma's taste had changed. As we know, he usually went for gay men, but Errol was straight. And the second, well, Errol happened to be the first guinea pig in his search to make the non-consensual, well, consensual. We can all agree that Dharma was out of control and Rita Isabel wanted to show him exactly what out of control really looked like. My name is Rita Isabel and I'm the oldest sister of Errol Lindsay. Jer whatever your name is, Satan. I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you! My I hate you! Step out of control! Don't Jeffrey, I'll kill you, goddammit! Look at me! Let me kill you! Watch your name, Sam! Let me kill you! This is the mother of Dharma's ninth victim. My name is Inez Thomas, and I'm the mother of David Thomas. She makes sure that her words are direct with Dharma. First, I want to let you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, about the pain that you caused my family. That was my baby boy that you took away from me. It's said that in September of 1990, Dharma met David Thomas outside the Grand Avenue Mall. As he did many times, he lured him back to his apartment. Thomas was one of four people whose bodies were never found. After hearing this as a mother, you can imagine how she felt. But that wasn't her main worry, because it's another family member who can't comprehend why David hasn't come home. He had a little child, Cortia. They'll never see her father again. She was only two. And now she sits in the window and she say, she asked her mother, mommy, where is Day Day? She called him Day Day. Where is Day Day? When is Day Day coming? And I think that's a sad thing for a child to see, to go through all her life and not know her father. This man should never be able to walk the face of earth or to be able to harm anyone else again. I'm not even sure whether uh, I was capable of a real sense of love even back then. I'm not even sure I am now. You don't know that you know how to love, is that what you're saying? I'm not sure I do. The person who can love, I don't think, would do these things. Now, this last reaction doesn't come from the voices of family or friends. This testimony comes from the one man who allowed the city of Milwaukee to not only stop living this nightmare, but to be able to start healing. This is Tracy Edwards, the one and only man who managed to survive the Milwaukee monster. So, hold your breath as we take you through the most horrific parts of Tracy Edwards' life-changing ordeal. On the evening of July 22nd, 1991, Dharma again lured another unsuspecting victim back to his Milwaukee apartment. Dollars for pictures, the usual routine. Everything seemed normal to Tracy, until sometime after they got to the apartment, when Dharma then manipulated focus towards the fish tank. That was when Dharma's mind flipped a switch. Okay, when you start talking about the fish in the fish tank, do you bring that up or does he? Uh, he does. I turn my 
turn to the right and like the fish tank is here, I'm turning all the way over here. To you. Uh, all of a sudden a handcuff and a knife is pulled on me. And, uh, first I feel fear, then I ask him what's going on, you know, this is not necessary, you know, to pull a knife on me at that Are you point. afraid? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have any reason to know why he did that? None whatsoever. The knife was like he had here, the knife was in his hand, he had it on me like this. But the record reflect he was holding his, the knife would in his right hand as he showed it, holding the cuff in his left hand, is that right? right. And your left hand is cuff. Yeah. Right. Where do you have the knife? What kind of a knife was it? It was like a military knife, knife a machete or some type, you know, he had lower, right up under my rib cage. He then led Tracy to the bedroom. He pleaded with him that he didn't have to do this. Tracy mentions that there was a movie playing on the VCR. Was there anything going on on the TV? Yeah, the Exorcist movies was playing at that time. What impression was made upon your mind by the conduct, action, manner, expression, and conversation that you observed of Mr. Dahmer? His frame of mind is what you want to know, right? Okay, he acted. At times, he would go through like different changes with me, you know? One Tell minute, us about that. One minute, he's like nice. Then he was telling he didn't want people to leave him or abandon him, things of this nature, you know? had uh, these obsessive uh, desires and, and uh, thoughts wanting to control them, to uh, possess them permanently. Well, what did you think about him as a person? What impression was made on your mind of this fellow that you're dealing with here? At times he wasn't himself, and then at times he was, was like a nice guy. Tell us about his chanting. What was that all about? It was just like, I can't tell you the words. I couldn't understand what he was saying at that time. It was like a slow slur, like mm, some of that nature, some close like that, I'm not sure. Off and on throughout the ordeal. Uh, just like back and forth, he would do it every now and then. It was like the part about the preacher that used to be a preacher that had got possessed and that uh, it would seem like he was like, it appear like, like it was like he wanted to mimic it or be like that part, you know, being demonized or whatever in that nature. I'm interested in that part. That part had his attention more than anything. It was like he changed with it at times. Then he would get more aggressive, try to get me to handcuff myself, both hands. And he's told me it made him feel more dominant. Dharma then told Tracy to get on the floor and lay on his stomach. For whatever reason, he laid on his side. But why? Okay, I kind of like laid on my sides for some reason. I guess God told me not to lay flat down or let this person handcuff me, so I didn't. He kind of laid across me, put his head across my chest at that point, like he was listening to my heart, because at a point he told me he was going to eat my heart at that point. He said he was going to eat your heart? Yes, that's correct. Did he still have the knife? Yeah. Where was the knife pointed? When I was on the floor, he had it pointed at my groin area at that time. I knew something was about to happen, so I suggested that I go to the bathroom. I had to use the bathroom at that time. Okay, then we go back into the bedroom. You know, it was like different time spans. We were talking about him leaving, his, losing his job. Then he would come to the person that I was first with, you know, and I was trying to comfort him, letting him know that I was a friend, you know, that I wasn't gonna try to run away from him or nothing like that. You were being cool. I guess God, you can say that because I had no control. I was just, it was just, I don't know. He eventually hit the peak of his nightmare. Yeah, he was like, like you're gonna have to do this and that, you know. Then he told me at a point I was gonna have to kill him or he, either he was gonna have to kill me at one point. Tracy then made another trip to the washroom, came out, asked for another beer, and then unbuttoned his shirt, a ploy to make Dharma feel more comfortable but something wasn't right. I told him uh, I want to sit in the front because it's an air conditioner and I was just going to try to jump out the window or go for the door or whatever. So I suggested we sit on the couch. I had him button my shirt to try to make him feel more at ease and he just start going out of himself again. Yeah. Going out of himself? Yeah, he was like paying me no attention at that time. Like yeah. he wasn't there? So yeah, he started the chanting again and it's like just sitting there, you know. And then I just, for some reason, I said, well, I need to go to the bathroom again. And he didn't follow me at that point. So I reached up, I got up, and then I got hit him and I ran out. Thanks to the actions of Tracy Edwards on July 19th, 1991, the people of Milwaukee can walk their streets safely once again. However, this came at a cost. 
Edwards himself endured a lifetime of torment, unable to recover from the psychological damage done that night in apartment 213. I think anyone that rushed with Dahmer and survived realized later that they'd had a close call with death itself. One couldn't, can't walk away knowing that you were virtually in the claws of a man who'd killed 15 people at least and not, it's gonna have some impact on you. Jason, 20 years ago, Tracy Edwards escaped Dahmer's apartment and led police to the serial killer. Today, Edwards was back in court, this time as the defendant. On the 20 years since Edwards led police to Jeffrey Dahmer, he has been in and out of jail. Friends say he struggled with drugs and alcohol and the legacy of being the one who got away.